Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming uh, to our panel on political correctness. I'm Molly Ball, a national political correspondent for Time Magazine. And we have a terrific lineup of panelists assembled here. Steven Pinker, professor of psychology at Harvard, author of many best-selling books, including the forthcoming Enlightenment Now, which argues sort of against the grain that things are actually getting better in the world in all kinds of ways. Uh, Parvathy. Santosh Kumar, who uh, is the who's based in Chicago, the director of network learning for Strive Together USA, which facilitates large-scale social change to advance opportunities in education and social mobility, and is here as part of the Global Shapers program. Uh, Lonnie Bunch, the legendary historian and founder <laughs> of uh, the new Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., which uh, if you've tried to get in, you know is the hottest ticket in DC. Still uh, difficult to get in, and, but if you do manage to, just an, an incredible experience. This was a, 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 I would say, lonely crusade that you waged for many, many years. A dream finally achieved to a spectacular effect, and it's also a, a beautiful building. Uh, and uh, So Young Kang is based in Singapore and is uh, here as a young global leader. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Nobi, which is a mobile learning platform for enterprises focused on mobile micro learning. So a very cool, diverse array of perspectives, which is kind of the point of what we are talking about, right, is how people with diverse pers per, uh, perspectives can communicate in this world rather than just tearing each other apart. Uh, which is a dynamic I'm very familiar with uh, as a political reporter. Um, so this, this idea of political correctness, you know, famously you, we have had um, on campuses, particularly in the United States, uh, campus protest speakers being shouted down and uninvited. Uh, this, these have now become sort of buzzwords, microaggressions and trigger warnings. And uh, these, are, these are real things, liberal professors that I know at universities all over the United States actually do sort of live in fear of their students and the and the and the micro controversies that can turn into uh, really toxic uh, situations. And then and then you have provocateurs like Milo Yiannopoulos who have exploited uh, this dynamic to uh, become sort of uh, to, to to deliberately provoke the so-called snowflakes and create these confrontations. Uh, and if, if you watch, for example, Fox News, you would think this is the leading problem facing America, the so-called censorship or the, the, the oppression of, of, of free speech by uh, liberal academia. Uh, so, and I would argue that this dynamic reached its sort of absurd conclusion in the 2016 election, which actually pitted a social justice warrior, Hillary Clinton, against an internet troll, Donald Trump. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so, so let's get into this. I want to start with, we had a sort of perfect case study uh, just this month uh, that, that Stephen was involved in, a, a social media controversy uh, involving, uh, involving something you said on a panel, in fact. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, we'll get one today. Uh, so Stephen, do you want can you can you tell this story in your own words and of, of, of how how it came to be that you were the subject of a headline on the Nazi Daily Stormer website that said Harvard Jew professor admits the alt right is right about everything. <laughs> right, uh, followed followed by a, a New York Times article called How Social Media Is Making Us Stupid. Uh, this is there was a, a panel at Harvard University. <coughs> excuse me, last fall. Uh, on the topic, did political correctness help elect Trump? Uh, I, uh, everyone on the panel argued that it, that it did, and uh, my own argument was that uh, political correctness, by uh, treating certain uh, facts as taboo, uh, helped stoke the alt-right by giving them the sense that there were truths that the uh, academic establishment could not uh, t uh, face up to. Therefore, giving, uh, and by alt-right, by the way, I don't mean torch-carrying skinheads. I mean the f highly educated, uh, mostly men, often in uh, tech, who find each other on the internet, uh, often highly literate, 
um, th these are are not uh, kind of knuck knuckle drag dragging brutes of the kind that we saw in Charlottesville. So let me just I just want to be clear of what I mean by the alt right. Uh, I know they exist because I have um, seen them among uh, students at Harvard University. Uh, they tend to stay under the uh, radar because they know that it, that uh, they would be in professional jeopardy. But uh, to people who say that there's there aren't any intelligent, literate um, people in the alt right, I can testify that that is, that is false. And what what feeds them is the the um, uh, hidden knowledge that uh, that certain facts are just taboo in respectable intellectual circles, and that only uh, increases their own sense of, uh, uh, of aggrievement and of superiority. Moreover, it, uh, I think it stokes the most pernicious interpretations of, of uh, a number of these facts, such as gender differences, um, such as differences between capitalist and, and um, uh, communist countries, such as differences in uh, statistics on crime among ethnic groups, where if those beliefs are allowed to fester in isolation, then uh, people who are aware of them can come up with the most, uh, can, can um, uh, descend to the most uh, toxic interpretations uh, of them. Whereas if they are out in the open, then they can be countered by uh, arguments that put them in, in perspective and that don't allow them to become fodder for some of the toxic beliefs of the alt-right. So I, the, the, the talk that I gave was on uh, how we're inadvertently uh, feeding the alt-right and what we ought to do to try to starve them. And then this, the <clears throat> remarks when they were put on the, um, uh, on, on a YouTube were then doctored by some of these alt-right um, sites. Mm -hmm. So that the parts where I said, well, they've, dis they've uh, discovered these um, facts that are, uh, that are truer in the record was not followed by, but yes, but then they have this perverse interpretation of them. Mm -hmm. um, then that led to a, uh, once it was, there were some alt-right sites that used this doctored video to uh, rather perversely argue that I was uh, in favor of, of uh, the alt-right, a, a, a movement that I absolutely loathe, and which the point of my remarks being, uh, what can we do to, uh, to, to uh, uh, combat it? Um, then I became the target of internet trolls on the left saying, well, this shows that he was that Pinker was sympathetic to the uh, alt-right all along, and he's shown his true colors. Um, fortunately, it was a controversy that was pretty much confined to um, social media, and uh, a, a number of excellent articles came out in the, in the Times, in The Guardian, uh, in, in a number of uh, blogs setting the record straight, so I didn't even have to say anything about it. I'd much rather be uh, kind of attacked by social media and defended by the mainstream media than, than the other way around. But it is a sign of how quickly even a kind of a meta discussion of the phenomenon of political correctness can be turned around by some of the uh, political correctness police to further distort and, and uh, muddy and, and indeed make debate stupider, as the, as the New York Times put it. So, but I guess the counter argument to the point that you were making would be do we really need to be discussing whether the Nazis have a point? Or, or whether, whether the arguments for racism have any legitimacy to them? I mean, in this day and age, ought there not be points of view that are taboo, that don't have a place in discussion? And, and do we, to some extent, uh, legitimize those points of view when we engage with them? I mean, Lonnie, maybe I'll open this up to you, uh, because so much of your work uh, is about presenting perspectives and points of view uh, and, and history that perhaps the dominant culture would prefer not to engage with. So, so what do you think about this question? Well, I mean, I think that if you look at this notion of political correctness, it's an interesting evolution, right? It evolved from a way for people who are anonymous and voiceless to demand a freer and fairer country. And it's evolved into this weapon um, that allowed people to sort of tamp down the debates and discussions that are essential for a democracy. My notion is, as reprehensible as you know, the Ku Klux Klan is to me, um, I really feel strongly that we've got to find the space to allow those conversations to have. That, because I look back in the 1960s, there were few opportunities for African Americans to raise the issues that were at the core of who they were 
suddenly you're allowed to have Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali on campuses at the time when many of the university hierarchy said that's not the direction we want to go. So I worry about saying there are certain things that are taboo. However, I feel strongly that debate and protest are at the heart of what we should be doing. So when in the National Museum of African American History, for example, um, some from the alt-right left nooses to sort of talk about, um, to suggest that what we were doing was politically correct. And um, my notion was, let us take those nooses, let us write about it in the op-eds, let us use them in the museum, um, and use them as points to basically argue that we need to understand our enemies, but we need to be able to contextualize it. And that's what I really try to do with my work. Uh, well, and, and Stephen, as you mentioned, so much of this does take place uh, on social media, on the internet, where, as you said, Lonnie, the, 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 uh, the empowering or the giving of a platform to so many people who previously might have been kept out by the gatekeepers of institutions uh, is, uh, is disturbing it to, to people perhaps in power. Uh, so Young, I, I'd like to hear uh, your international perspective on this issue for one thing, uh, but also as someone who works in social media and technology, whether you think uh, that those are a, a force for good or evil in this regard. <laughs> No, I think it's um, what's been really interesting, I think, especially with technology, social media, this whole topic of political correctness. So I'm actually American. So I'm Korean American from East Brooklyn, New York. Mm. And uh, I moved to Singapore seven years ago. And, um, you know, I think having, and now living in Singapore for seven years, what I'm realizing is I don't think I had as much freedom of speech as I thought I did in the U.S. because of political correctness. Because there are so many important topics that need to be discussed and debated but are shut down and hushed because they are sensitive. And so what I realized, actually, even in terms of religious freedom, I find more religious freedom in Singapore, oddly enough, than I do in the US. Because you, know, you, have, mosque, you have mosques, churches, and temples all sit, you know, literally next to each other on the same street. And people are very free to talk about those things. So when you talk about social media, I think part of the challenge we have is that technology has unintentionally dehumanized people. And so what ends up happening is that your sound bite then equals you, the person, the character. Now, if I have a relationship with Lonnie and we get to know each other and then we have a debate, I'm not going to hate his guts because he's a different point of view than me because I know his person and I think he's a good person and I'll know the whole person versus just that sound bite totally taken out of context. So I think part of the challenge with social media and with Twitter and sound bites is that you don't have the person. It's not a human being that you're talking to. You're debating about a certain point or something taken in one context and then you actually make judgments. So my, my big, uh, I, guess, I guess, worry is around how people are equating a point of view with the person. Mm -hmm. And technology is actually fostering that. So I wonder if there's an opportunity to start to, I don't know, to think, to rethink how we engage with humans and understand that your point of view does not equal all of you. Mm -hmm. And I can disagree with you, and it's OK. I can respectfully disagree and still like you as a human being where it's so difficult to do that today. Mm -hmm. Even when you know people, there's so many friendships that have been broken up because of different political views. 20 years of friendship, 30 years, that's absolutely ridiculous. Your views don't form who you are. And so I think with social media, it actually just compounds that. So then you have that kind of continuing and then it's overnight, right? Then you're a character. You've gone from you know, a liberal-minded person to an all-right supporter because of one comment. And I mean, you know, obviously you're not, right? So it's just the, the craziness of, I think, all of that. Uh, and, and so, Parv, I want to ask you sort of the opposite question. As someone who works on the ground with vulnerable populations, is this a debate that sort of, I think this often can feel to me like it, it, it's not a real problem, right? The, or, it's, or it's sort of a first world problem. And for people who are actually struggling with poverty and inequality, I, does this, have, does this debate have any impact, or, or is it somewhat divorced from their reality? Yeah, it's a really important question because this often, to me, feels like its own form of work avoidance, where people, instead of actually addressing the root causes of inequities that exist in our country and actually talking about things like systemic oppression or institutional racism, are talking about the words and the language we use instead of actually talking about the real issues. And so if we can instead get people to 
get past the, the debate about language and have conflict at the language level or at the personal conflict level and move to a place where we can actually identify what's the shared result we actually want to achieve for our world and how can we actually work beyond our differences and work across lines of difference to get there. And that's the work that I do at Strive Together, a national organization where we're working in communities to help people across different sectors come together around uh, common goals for uh, ensuring that every kid has a path to economic mobility. And so instead of saying, um, instead of arguing about whether people in, of, of different sides of the political spectrum have different perspectives about whether every child can succeed, we kind of help people work through that. And whether from places that are urban, like progressive Portland, where people are talking about race and inequity very openly, to places where, like rural Racine, where it's not as talked about, we're coaching leaders through the process of actually working through having productive dialogue about this in a way that gets to action, action and results for kids and families on the ground, as opposed to having a theoretical debate about what this is about. And if you are in the audience and you have a, a burning question that's eating you up inside, feel free to wave frantically at me at any point. But I do plan to open up for questions uh, toward the last uh, 15, 20 minutes. So be thinking of, of, of smart questions that are that are questions and not speeches uh, when we get to that point. Uh, but yeah, Stephen, you, you had something you wanted to say here. Yeah, <clears throat> just to, um, I think, to, to uh, actually exemplify my argument, Molly, the way you even kind of framed your first question, I think is, uh, although you're obviously meaning to uh, elicit discussion, but it itself, I think, exemplifies the problem. You say, well, should we really be discussing whether Nazi opinions uh, deserve to be debated? Now, an example of the, uh, um, the kind of point that I made that, it, that is uh, often taboo in academia is whether the, the sexes differ, whether men are indistinguishable from women. And I'm going to state, as a fact, men and women aren't identical. There's a lot of scientific evidence that that's true. There's a lot of common sense evidence that that's true. Very few uh, women bosses emerge naked from the shower or masturbate in front of their male employees. I think that's a pretty robust sex difference. Uh, and we know that some men, many men do. Uh, now, is that a Nazi opinion? If it is, what you're, to, to say that, that to acknowledge differences between men and women is a, a Nazi opinion, first of all, it removes all credibility uh, because it just so defies both common sense and science. And also, for uh, impressionable young people who don't know any better, it's saying, well, geez, I guess I'm a Nazi because I believe that. So part of my argument is that that kind of, uh, uh, of equation, that certain beliefs which, for which there is an enormous amount of evidence are so taboo that we're going to call them Nazis, N Nazi beliefs is only going to encourage uh, ne uh, young neo-Nazis or the alt-right more generally. So we, one of the many reasons that we should be uh, mindful of excessive taboo and um, demonization of, part of particular opinions is, is that it could backfire by both sapping the credibility of academia and journalism if there are certain things that anyone with eyes can see are true but you're not allowed to say, uh, and in, uh, perversely embolden exactly the kind of people that we want to marginalize. Okay, but you uh, work on a campus, and one of the arguments that I've heard about this is that this is just college kids being dumb, as college kids are wont to do, and it doesn't, it, it, outside the borders of uh, you know, liberal academia, which has always been a punching bag, uh, for for the right, this this isn't a real thing. No, it's not just students; it's also professors. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, it's the professors are often often uh, encouraging the students. And the, the students do take their cues as to what uh, they 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 can uh, get away with. Uh, and there's it's actually not so much professors, but the student life administrators, the kind of middle management that's kind of taking over the university that is uh, it, encouraging the suppression of speech and the uh, conspicuous outrage. But the reason that it's not just college kids is that it casts into doubt the entire scientific and scholarly um, uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, so I'll give you an, an example. Um, I do talk to some people, influential people some, on the right. Uh, who say things like, um, well, uh, I know that uh, all you scientists say that, that uh, climate change is caused by uh, human activity, but everyone knows that the uh, academia is, uh, is infected by political correctness, so why should we take that seriously? 
And the thing is that if they have a case in certain propositions where there really is squelching of debate, where there is demonization of people who are proposing quite reasonable hypotheses, it, it corrodes the credibility of the university um, uh, institutions uh, on the whole. Uh, and that, that's a, a second pernicious effect of political correctness, together with encouraging the toxic elements of the alt-right. But of course, the most obvious one is that if only certain hypotheses can be discussed, there's just no way that you can understand the world, because no one a priori knows the truth. It's only by putting hypotheses out there and evaluating them that you can hope to increase your knowledge about the world. Yeah, yeah Sam. Yeah, because I, I, I think, you know, part of, and I totally agree with you, because I think one of the challenges is just because we don't talk about it or allow it to be spoken, it doesn't mean that those beliefs don't exist. Right. So what ends up happening is you could say, yeah, don't talk about your point of view because it actually, you know, I detest your point of view. So then we just kind of stop the conversation. You're going to go off and go develop your own point of view and go talk to people who feel the same as you. And then we'll further polarize kind of different communities, which is exactly what we're seeing happen today. And it's not going to change just because we don't allow people to uh, talk about racism. It still exists. So I, I'd like to get to the root cause and allow people to talk about in uncomfortable situations and be a little bit uncomfortable. I think we're so pressed on being happy, happy, and comfortable all the time and smiling you know, with people that you know, deep inside I know have completely different views than I do. And I kind of would like a little bit more honesty and a little bit more integrity and authenticity to say, if you have a different point of view, like I'd love to hear it. Let's have a conversation. I will not attack you. Please don't attack me. And let's have an honest dialogue. One of the, um, the, the social experiments, which I am actually planning to do, still planning to do it, is actually to, uh, to apply to the Ku Klux Klan and to go in. And one you know, day during all this election, I was going through and clicking the sites, and then I happened to uh, see an article. So of course, Facebook is immediate. As soon as one like, positive article comes off you know, on the alt-right, all of a sudden, all my Facebook feeds are kind of alt-right. And so I, 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 and I clicked on, and I went to the website, and I actually went to their code of ethics. And why did I do that? I spent the weekend doing that. Because I want to understand, what do they believe? What are they saying that's so different from my point of view? And how different? Is it really that different? And what I was shocked to find is I said, I kind of understand what they're saying. And I understand why their appeal is so big. right? Because they, uh, they're being kind of demonized. And so when you're demonized, you're a victim. You kind of come and you go, I'm going to go find people who are not going to demonize me and who are going to accept me for who I am. And then you start to kind of uh, facilitate that. So I think it's really dangerous when we start to actually prohibit any kinds of speech. And I almost encourage people to be intentionally just comfortable. How are we going to stretch our minds if we combine our, if we, if we surround ourselves with people who think like us, who look like us, who dress like us? Um, I don't, how do we grow? You know, I think we grow from discomfort. Parv, you wanted to? Yeah, I think part of the challenge with, with what you're talking about, right, is that people don't necessarily have the, the skill set to be able to have those uncomfortable conversations in a productive way. And, and so part of what we have an obligation to do as leaders is to help figure out how do we empower people to have conversations and get uncomfortable in a way that doesn't uh, continue the polarization. And so particularly because there's such a tendency for people when they're having conversations, you're listening not necessarily to learn, but to win. Mm -hmm. And so to avoid this dichotomy of having people just having a conversation to get listening only to say the next argument, but to actually get to a place where people can have real authentic conversation about what's actually behind your belief system, that's where we need to do. And so things like helping people understand how to slow down your cognitive process, like use the ladder of inference as a tool to say, well, what, what's behind that belief that you have? What's the data? What's the evidence? But to get that, you have to have the patience with people, and people aren't necessarily always there, particularly in a social media context. But in some ways, it's really, in my mind, there's two big issues. <laughs> One is the social media impact, right? The fact that what was once a ripple becomes a wave, mm -hmm. becomes an avalanche as a result of social media. I think about when we opened the National Museum, and I began to anticipate what I was going to be attacked by. Um, I was stunned that the biggest attack was social media from the right attacking the museum about Clarence Thomas, arguing that the museum was run by left-wing historians. Well, that's true. Um, <laughs> but that the notion was that using that was a conscious decision to say there's only a certain part of blackness that's acceptable, mm -hmm. and that black conservatives like Clarence Thomas aren't acceptable. And suddenly, the right 
um, regardless of race, really use social media to attack the museum and to attack its credibility on that. And what was so fascinating to me is that we would get hundreds of emails a day. And we had to really put in place a whole strategy to handle that. Whereas it would have been a ripple that I would have handled with an op-ed, um, suddenly it was something that we had to plan a whole media strategy. So it means that even ideas that really aren't worthy of real long debate, you have to, have, you have to address. The other issue for me, though, is that what I worry about most about not having these debates is the idea that the most important thing I think educators, whether they are on campus, in museums, can really do is help the public embrace ambiguity. I think in some ways the notion of ambiguity, of not settling for simple answers to complex questions, is really the key to a good democracy. And I would argue that that is the goal we should be striving for and that often a lot of our debates around political correctness really allow us, as you said, to talk to people of like minds, um, to not have that debate and that ambiguity. In essence, what we're really asking for is for people to be comfortable with the tension that comes from um, sort of freedom of speech, but also the responsibility to listen. Right. Mm -hmm. It is, though, easy to, I mean, you're, you're uh, anecdote about the nooses is so chilling, and so many of the uh, of these conflicts uh, disproportionately affect the people who are already victims of systemic injustice. And it's easy to say we should all be made uncomfortable but when the people who are being made uncomfortable are people being traumatized by having you know a noose put at their door, which it, which feels a lot different, I think, if you're an 18 year old. Uh, College student on financial aid who's uh, who's uh, on a campus for the first time, um, are are we are you know are we are we comforting the Nazis and 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 afflicting uh, people of color when we when we turn political correctness uh, into the into the subject of debate like this? Well, I, I don't think it's about accepting, right? So I think that that's maybe the um, where I'll kind of disagree with you know kind of the the way that it's being positioned to allow someone to disagree or to, to create space and a safe space for people to have different points of view doesn't say I agree or I approve what you're saying. I mean, the whole idea is that, for example, in, in the news situation, which is absolutely horrible, and it's um, to take them away doesn't uh, negate the fact that there are people um, who actually believe that, right? So you can, and, and so I think that when you have, you almost can use that to actually spark debate. Like for those people who uh, send you the emails, like invite them to coffee. Like it'd be kind of cool to just invite them all into a room and have a con like and have coffee. And as human beings and just have conversations, <laughs> like, why do you believe what you do? And it's like, it's that whole thing of asking questions and asking the why questions. So for me, like I think a big part of this critical thinking, mm -hmm. I think if we can develop and kind of encourage people to be really critical and they're thinking about everything, you know, how do we know what we know? Do we actually know what we know? Even our points of view right now, we're sitting in this room largely, I think I would assume most of us have probably similar points of view. Maybe I'm wrong, because if, you, you know, if I am, I'd love to hear you ask a really different question, right? Because if we start to encourage uh, each other to ask these critical questions, why, where do you come from, and we can humanize the conversations, then we start to actually separate just the what from the why. And I think part of the challenge is we debated the what all the time. Short what's, 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 what's but we don't get a sense of why they feel that way. And sometimes when you hear the stories of why they feel that way, it kind of changes actually the whole context of that conversation. You know, and, and, and I think for me in technology, you know, I run a mobile platform and part of what I've been doing actually is causing people to think. I don't think learning and education should be a passive experience. And part of my, I guess, hope for education and educators is actually is what you do in the classroom, but then to use technology to do the same thing, which is teach people how to think. That's probably the most valuable thing that we can give to this generation and to society is the tools to be able to do that. But yeah. teaching people how to think doesn't mean that you accept the kind Absolutely. of racism that comes Absolutely. with the news. I mean, for me, the news was the opportunity to contextualize this, exactly. right? To talk about what this means, what, how it is a symbol of violence and hate, um, what is it meant historically, and really trying to illuminate that 
anybody who thinks that's a smart thing to do really is somebody that doesn't understand what it means. Absolutely. And so I guess for me the notion is that while I want to hear these different points of view, I want to make sure that we attack them vigorously, that we really um, confront them and really use protest and use our own abilities to marshal social media to count them, because I think that's really important. You know, I'm not asking for equal play. What I'm asking for is let us understand the debates, but let us make sure that we make the arguments that we make that counter some of the horrible racism, et cetera. Steve? Yeah, well, I think it's important that we realize that, well, the, the issue of political correctness is not about the, the right to leave nooses at the uh, Museum of African American History. Right. And I think, in fact, equating controversial uh, arguments made with evidence and arguments in an academic context with leaving a noose is part of the problem. Uh, leaving a, <clears throat> a noose, uh, I'm not enough of a First Amendment expert to know whether that would be protected speech or whether it would be considered an intimidation or a threat which is not protected. But that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about, say, advancing hypotheses on why the homicide rate increased in the United States in the past two years and was it a result of police uh, <clears throat> uh, withdrawing from uh, active policing, the kind of thing that Heather McDonald was uh, shouted out of the room for uh, arguing. Uh, a data-driven, reasonable position might be right, might be wrong, we won't know until we examine it. That's not the same as leaving a noose. <clears throat> and I think the uh, idea that any hypothesis that departs from a certain left-wing orthodox orthodoxy is like leaving a noose is part of the problem that there has to be a range of opinions that are just, which are nowhere near intimidation, threats of violence, uh, but that we have to allow into the arena if we're gonna figure out how the world works and if we're gonna preserve the credibility of journalism and academia. Uh, do you get the sense that, that students have gotten more illiberal, less tolerant of other points of view? There are some data suggesting that, but on the other hand, <coughs> uh, in the 60s and 70s, students were pretty intolerant. Uh, there were no social media. There were um, protests against people like Richard Herrnstein, even when he talked about pigeons because of his arguments uh, about the heritability of intelligence. Uh, E.O. Wilson, also uh, of Harvard, got picketed and shouted down and his classroom was invaded and someone threw a bucket of ice water over his head. Uh, I think at the Smithsonian, in fact. Mm -hmm. We're uh, proud of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I mean, uh, in terms of Singapore, I mean, Singapore is certainly not a paradigm of free speech. Oh, absolutely. You can be imprisoned for, uh, uh, you know, most of our, our late night comedians would be in jail in Singapore. In Singapore. Uh, there, so it, it's, even though I think social media can contribute to, to it, the idea that people who disagree with you are evil and are legitimate targets of uh, intimidation, I think is probably part of human nature. I think free speech is highly unintuitive. Uh, it's Everyone understands why there should be free speech for themselves. The idea that there should be free speech for people that you disagree with is a major accomplishment of, uh, of the Enlightenment. It's one of the things that America should be proudest of. It's deeply unintuitive, and it's constantly going to be pushing back against the conviction that we all have that we're everything that we believe is obviously correct and obviously immoral, and anyone who disagrees with us is obviously stupid and obviously evil. Social media amplify that, but I think that's deep in human nature. Well, and social media in a lot of ways has just made people confront each other in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have to do in the real world. And, and, and sort of one of the arguments really of the alt-right is that humans are inherently tribal creatures who prefer to be around their own. And it is, we have unnaturally forced diverse populations together, which inevitably creates conflict. I mean, uh, Parv, do you see a way forward uh, in helping people coexist in a diverse society in, in a respectful way, or, or, or does that just go against our grain as humans? Right, I think part of, part of the mental model that needs to shift is that, conf that all conflict is bad in some senses, that part of, what, part of this debate is that this is a byproduct of us becoming a more multicultural society, that people have to figure out how do we behave with people who don't look exactly like ourselves? How do we, how do we create a, a culture of inclusion in our communities. And, and to do that, we have to help people manage that process. And, and thinking about the opportunities that we have to, to help people work together and, and talk across lines of difference, they're like creating convening spaces for that. And 
because it is it is the way of the future. We're, we're here and talking about the fourth industrial revolution and what it offers and the possibilities and how we need to continue to, I feel like inclusion is coming up over and over again as a theme in many of the conversations that are happening here. And so this is kind of an obligation that I see that we have and that we have to take action. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting, you know, I just had a thought as you were sharing that, you know, we're talking about this topic, right, about like uh, listening and we're talking at a very, very intellectual level. Um, but actually, why people get pissed is actually at a heart level. It's at a very emotional level. And so uh, I wonder, you know, you know, even in our dialogues, if we can connect with people at the heart level, we have much more of a chance of connecting with another human being and actually developing empathy. See, part of the challenge is that we're st the starting point already is you have a different point of view than, than, than me, so we're going to figure out how we're going to debate and actually win, right, and, and prove you wrong in what that is. And, and at that level, like no one's going to win. No one emerges actually as a winner. You start to intellectually kind of attack each other versus empathy. And I think if we need a lot more empathy. And so I think part of having cross uh, different communities come together, I think has to start with empathy and not with the head. And so I think we're almost like in terms of the way that we're approaching, it maybe need to rethink the idea of political correctness. Maybe it's around political empathy, right? Or it's about how do we actually try to put ourselves in other people's shoes and try to walk and understand where they're coming from, from a heart level. That is, I think, the closest thing we have to actually having respectful disagreements and respectful dialogue. Because if we see at this level, the whole time you're already in your kind of in war mode, and I'm going to try to intellectually over-intellectualize and basically intellectually beat you. The curiosity, is, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. The curiosity is super important, and I think what's also important is that people don't feel like you have to agree on everything to be able to work together. Because I think often what people believe is that we have to get past every disagreement and conflict before we can actually work productively together. And instead, we could actually, as a society, like move further towards our global goals if we instead put aside some of our differences. And, and if you really ask those why questions like you're talking about, eventually you get to the same places in terms of what's good for humanity. And so instead of trying to find agreement on every single thing, if you instead put aside some differences and, and work together towards a shared vision, you, you'll have a shot at actually making some progress. But I think the challenge then is, what are the spaces that allow that to happen, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not doing that on campuses, mm -hmm. if you're not using museums and cultural sites to do that, where are they? And so That's I would argue that one of the most important things is in this debate around political correctness is to make sure we guarantee that there are spaces that we can bring these things together. Uh, you know, now I'm a museum guy, right? But I love the fact that all the statistics suggest that museums are one of the most trusted things in the world, not just in the United States. And so what I expect museums to do is seize their political opportunity mm -hmm. to be these spaces that allow us not to find simple answers, um, maybe not even to find common ground, but maybe to find common frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I worry about, is where are those moments where we find those frameworks that allow the effective debates? Um, because we're never going to agree on, on all these issues, but I think that if we don't have those spaces, we suffer as a democracy. Mm -hmm. It's obviously just a total coincidence and not self-serving that uh, you're advocating for more museums as the solution to this problem. Thank you for uh, saying that. <laughs> I agree, more museums, also more magazines. Um, but, uh, but so, and I, I am going to uh, ask all of you to, to talk about concrete ways that you think we can uh, move forward and, and, and find solutions to these problems. And then I'm gonna open it up, so please be thinking about questions for the for the panel. But so Young, what do you think? You, you have talked a little bit, but um, particularly in the technology space, what do you think are some ways that we can advance mutual understanding and get past the, these political correctness, this toxicity? Yeah, I, I think technology can play a critical role because, and I think technology has a huge responsibility, actually. I wrote a piece, um, actually for WEF, called Is Tech Ever Really Neutral? And it, I don't believe it's neutral. It's not just a platform. It's uh, it was intentional design. So as someone who's building a has a mobile platform, I have uh, there's thousands of programs that people are creating. I do feel it's uh, I have a responsibility. My team has and my company has a responsibility to understand what types of conversations and what types of programs are being created on our platform. But on our platform, uh, one of the things that I was really intentional about was to develop critical thinking skills, creativity in the platform, and collaboration. 
because I don't want people to just have pat answers and also to take information passively. So what's happening is now you kind of scroll, scroll, scroll down your Facebook feed, you read, 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 and you have this false sense of knowing and understanding, and it's actually not really true. And so um, almost going back to the Socratic method of actually asking the why questions, um, you know, we actually do that on our platform. We actually say, you know, you've read this article, you've heard this thing. What do you think? What is your point of view? And we actually encourage that. And so I think the more we can um, use technology, and, and the beauty of technology is you can do the same thing at scale. And the more, just by asking the questions, it's, it's actually remarkable what happens right neurologically, is just by asking you why, it starts to shift the conversation. And so I think that's a critical part. And, and if technology can be used not to tell, and only tell, 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 or show, 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 but to ask, I think that's actually ask, encourage, um, and, and create a safe environment. Is I think at the end of the day, um, a lot of this actually starts with caring. Like if I don't care about your point of view, like no matter what you say, it actually really doesn't matter. Like if I don't care about you, like it doesn't matter if we can agree to disagree on even wanting to work together. Like I kind of have to care and want to work with you first, and then I'm willing to overcome the differences. And so there's something um, that a technology can be used to do that. I think that's actually really huge. And because we're talking about political correctness, uh, and I'd love for us to use social media and technology to almost start a new movement, um, almost like anti-PC, maybe hashtag respectfully disagree, to actually create a safe space that says, hashtag I respectfully disagree, but I like you as a human being, but I wanna be clear that I just disagree with your points of view and this is why, right? To create safety. And it's almost like the combination of the human and the point of view versus the dehumanization, which um, is a technology is neutral, like it, it can be used both ways, right? So if we decide to use technology in a way to actually rehumanize, I think we can. And that's actually the power because it's just what we as humans put on it, right? And how we use it. So I think there, there can be more intentionality in order to really encourage respectful disagreements. Well, and, and, and Lana, you, you've talked about some of the, the difficulties, the controversies that attended the opening of the museum. But in general, do you feel it's been a, it's been a positive story? I mean, the outpouring of, of attention and, uh, uh, and, and acceptance of, of the museum, has that been encouraging to you? It really has become that safe space where um, there are very few places, for example, where we cross racial lines, right? In this museum, 45 to 50 percent of the visitors are non-African American. You find then these opportunities time and time again for people to come together around some of the most horrible things that we may show in the museum. But it gives people the, the sort of freedom to cross those lines and discuss. Um, I find, I mean, I'm an optimistic historian, right? You know, I mean, come on, I grew up being called names that um, amazed me that I, didn't, that, I, that I didn't punch everybody in the face. Um, and what I'm struck by, though, is a belief that looking at history tells us that it is not without struggle, it is not without loss, but boy, if people are willing to come together to take the risk, you change a country. Um, and so uh, I think that when I see people come together in the museum or throughout the Smithsonian, I'm optimistic in part, not Pollyannish, but optimistic because people are seeing relatively unvarnished truth and they're taking that and saying, we can do better. We have done better. Well, Parv, are you also an optimist? And, what do you, and where, where do you see uh, progress in this area? Yeah, I would definitely classify myself as an impatient optimist here mm -hmm. in thinking that we, we have made a lot of progress, but we have a lot more work to do, and we, we can't wait to start working, to continue working and, and accelerating the progress that has been made. And so I think personally, we have uh, an obligation to be lifelong learners and not just in our bubbles, right? And so how are we seeking opinions outside of ourselves and, and, and listening and learning and continuing to ask ourselves why and trying to avoid our own confirmation bias and confront our own implicit bias as well. And then as institutions, I think we have an obligation to create those convening spaces, not just for the sake of conversation, but for the sake of action. And so setting ambitious targets for the, the social good you want to see in the world and then identifying who in your community or in the world needs to be involved at that table to make that happen. Not just the ones that you always agree with, but, but everybody who has a contribution to play, and then figure out how can we productively align these contributions in service of reaching that ambitious target. 
And Stephen, I, this debate having been percolating for several years, and, and really in a lot of ways it's a, it's a flashback or an echo to the, the speech code debates of the 90s and, and even before that, I, have we figured it out yet? Have, 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 have campuses and, and the broader public debate found ways to, to, to fix this? Do you see a way to fix it? I think the rationale for free speech has to be articulated. It can't just be a, a shibboleth. It can't just be some, a, a label for something that people that some people think is good, some people think is bad. But, but as part of our educational system, we have to remind people of why the principle of free speech was hard won, why it does go, uh, why we the reason that we need it is that uh, humans are uh, highly fallible. Most of the things we think are right, history will show to be wrong. Uh, and that a lot of human progress was advanced when people voiced heterodox opinions uh, in the face of opposition, and that the, what we enjoy today is the result of politically incorrect opinions of, of uh, yesterday. In particular, it's crucial that free speech not be allowed to become a right-wing issue, and I think that is the, the biggest danger. Once it is, then, then we're really in trouble because people's beliefs are so determined by their political allegiance by their, their tribalism, that uh, if free speech becomes associated with the right, then uh, campuses and a lot of uh, media will, uh, will just ab abandon uh, defending it. So I think we have to remind people of how uh, <clears throat> restrictions on free speech, the political incorrectness, uh, political correctness of the past was often used by the right to suppress the left, and that advances such as civil rights, such as the anti-war movement, crucially depended in their time on what used to be considered politically incorrect and that was only voiced because there was enough of a commitment to free speech that they, uh, that they could be expressed and then carried the day, uh, in, say, in the opposition to the war in Vietnam, opposition to Jim Crow laws, uh, and so on. Conversely, it is in societies that enforce their version of political correctness that you get descent into totalitarianism, such as in um, Soviet Russia and Maoist China and Na Nazi Germany. They all began by criminalizing speech. That just has to be part of the, uh, the, the knowledge of any educated person, it has to be part of the conventional wisdom, not just that free speech is a good thing, but why it's a good thing. And to your, to your point about uh, things getting better all the time, uh, my uh, parents attended the Univers University of Wisconsin-Madison in the 70s when there were literally bombings yeah. and people dying in campus protests. So this idea that just because some kids are marching around and are mad and at the cafeteria food that this is a crisis, uh, maybe it's not so bad. I'd love to throw it out to the audience. I'll, we'll start right here in front. If you can tell us, uh, there's a microphone coming up, if you can tell us who you are and where you're from and then uh, your question for the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Sheard from, uh, I'm an economist, S&B, uh, Global. Um, Two things that always kind of uh, sort of strike me as not being very productive, and maybe you know, pernicious was a, used, a word that was used, is um, pitting, using labels, putting labels on people, putting people in boxes. People say something and automatically they're labeled something. That doesn't seem to be helpful. The other is this rush to judgment, 24-7, um, you know, cable TV, uh, social media, etc. cetera, um, that before we've had a chance to even understand what the context is, what the facts are, et cetera, people are out there. Um, making conclusions, putting people in boxes. How do we push back? Or, I mean, do you agree that, that those two things are actually quite, uh, quite pernicious? And so sort of how can we push back against uh, those factors? Now, the problem is putting people in boxes, probably a, a pretty strong human heuristic. Um, and um, you know, saying that I don't know, I need to think about this more, uh, doesn't exactly sell newspapers and attract eyeballs. But how do we push back on those? Selling newspapers, by the way, very important. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, but you know, a, a word, that, a phrase, a buzzword we haven't used so far is identity politics, mm -hmm. right? And this is uh, also something that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, it's important to people for people to assert their identities, right? I mean, we have to allow people to do that without, with, without this rush to judgment. Would anybody like to, like yeah. to take that one? Well, I think you know part of it actually is, um, you know, I, I think as influencers, so we have an we almost have a, I think we have an obligation to actually humanize the conversation so that we don't jump. We're not part of the people who are actually uh, progressing that and not jump to snap judgments, but also sometimes to be a little bit comp like a little bit complex. So for example, uh, I'm a Korean American uh, from New York. 
uh, we're all good at math, and there's all kinds of stereotypes that you can put against Korean Americans. I don't know what they are, but whatever they are. And so the more I actually can talk about things that are almost totally contrary to what people would stereotype and use my social media platform and use our kind of influence to actually start to change those narratives and tell more holistic, complex stories of people, I think the more difficult it becomes, it becomes to actually box people in. So I think part of it, from, you know, from the perspective of people at this forum, is because we do have big audiences, is to try to broaden the conversation as much as possible. And one of the things um, you know, that I've started to do, and I, you know, and I see a lot of my friends doing it as well, is actually to humanize conversations on social media, especially in the web, to say things like, I don't know, or that, hey, that's a really good question. What do you think about that? And not having to be the smartest person in the room. And um, it requires a lot of confidence to do that, because I think there is this knee-jerk reaction to want to be right and to have that kind of that answer. And so uh, I think as leaders, that's part of leadership, you know, to also be, I think it's actually um, more honest to be, uh, to be honest. Like, we don't know the answers. We don't know all the answers. And it's impossible even for this question in this debate to pretend that I have an answer or that any of us have the answer. It's a conversation. And so I think having uh, the conversation is more important. And so I think we can facilitate that. It's hard, though. It's hard, right? Well, and Stephen, as a psychologist, I have to get your, your thoughts on the sort of human nature end of, of this equation, whether we are so hardwired uh, to can, can we see from outside the perspective of of our identities, or are we, uh, you know, just inevitably do we, we're we're judgmental beings, right? We we are judgmental beings, but I would I, I would disagree with the word um, inevitable and, and hardwired. Okay. Simply, I, I think that what it means is that it's always going to be a struggle that we're, we can never take free speech for granted because it, it does go against human nature. On the other hand, human nature also includes the ability to. Um, abstract away from things, to understand principles like free speech, to be reminded and persuaded about why they're, uh, they're good things. Uh, what it often will involve is even within each of ourselves to suppress certain instincts that bubble up as a first reaction, as, as a snap judgment, and think, well, gee, maybe I should think twice about my own convi conviction. And before I uh, leap to an accusation, Maybe free speech, and, or may, maybe just the, the uh, ability to stand back and consider the other person's view. Gee, maybe that should apply to me too, not just to the other guy. Uh, so I think it'll always be a struggle, but I don't think it is uh, that it's hopeless, that, that the dark side of human nature will always win. Uh, yeah, let's go over here. Uh, second from the back, the, yes. I'm Jennifer Puccioli, I'm a professor at INSEAD Business School. So a lot of the things I heard the panel talk about were political correctness between groups, right? So the, you know, the academics versus the far right or the, you know, Americans versus the nationalities. What I'm concerned about is political correctness within groups, and particularly at the moment with the Me Too movement within women. So in France, we had a lot of women put forward um, a big newspaper article in Le Monde putting a different viewpoint across, and they were totally slapped down by women saying, we should all have the same opinion, we should all bring together. So I'm interested what you think we can do within groups um, to stop this issue of political correctness. Great question. Who, who would like to tackle that? Yeah. You know, I, think, I think it's a, uh, a, a, a profound question, because one of the, um, <clears throat> the Painful aspects of identity politics is paradoxically it can it is a, can be a kind of racism and sexism by assuming that if you're a woman you must have a particular belief which kind of runs against the principle that the, the whole point of gender equity is that that uh, women are, are individuals have opinions have arguments behind their opinions similarly to African Americans there is certain a uh, uh, a widespread tendency to assume. That, that if you're African American, you have a particular opinion. This is kind of factually incorrect, obviously. Uh, it, but and it is partly behind the, I, I think, unarticulated uh, of, um, argument for the, the ideal of diversity, where uh, the justification for uh, affirmative action policies that's been recognized by the courts and that's been uh, advanced by universities is we need uh, a lot of diversity. Where if diversity is defined by a bunch of different skin colors, a bunch of different ancestries, it kind of assumes that every person of a skin color has a particular opinion and that's the way you diversify opinion, which is a, a, a kind of perverse uh, uh, 
diversity on campus has often been ridiculed as people who look different but think alike. And certainly the, the principle that just because you're a Korean American or a woman or an African American or, or uh, uh, come from a southern small town, your opinions are predictable is one of the, uh, the most undesirable features of identity politics. But it also really raises the issue of how within the groups you handle your own debates and your own diversity. I mean, I think there was a lot of struggle in the 1960s to not say there was an African American community, but that there were many points of view. And that is something that within African American educational and political leadership, we continue to wrestle with, that we consciously say that it's not a single monolithic group. And so I think some of that is incumbent upon the community itself to basically stand up and say, you know what, um, we're not all the same. Well, but how did you end up handling the, the Clarence Thomas controversy? Or there was also one about Ben Carson, correct? How did you, how did you deal with figures like that in the museum? Well, I mean, I think that the notion of, of recognizing that nobody gets into a museum just because they're black, <laughs> right? Um, that in essence, a museum explores intellectual questions and that we weren't looking at a history of the Supreme Court, for example. Um, if we were doing that, we would, might look at then Clarence Thomas. But the reality was that there are certain decisions you make based on the scholarship, and there was a decision not to go in that direction. You could make an argument that that was a mistake, but the reality was, for me, it was making sure I made clear that it's not a decision based on politics, but based on scholarship. All right. Uh, I think we've got time for one, maybe two more. Let's go to the front row right here. So building off of that, Lonnie, and then building off of the question about the Me Too movement, if you think about the, the egregious sexual violence that sparked the Me Too movement, and you think about the nooses, right, that we found at the Smithsonian. My name is Molly. I work with Lonnie at the Smithsonian. One of my worries is that it's so, hopefully for most of us, it's so easy to be so against the noose, and it's so easy to be so against the sexual violence that I worry as a woman that the Me Too movement is a, f a shiny thing that allows us to get behind women in a way that doesn't actually get to the root cause of most of the social injustice with women, which is much more subtle, um, much more behind the scenes, and frankly, much more egregious, and that affects much more of us than the ones that have been victimized so violently. And so I wonder how, Lonnie, for example, when you think about the noose, how do you use the noose, or is there a way to use the noose or to use sexual violence in order to open up the conversation that's more difficult about kind of these um, really horrible ways that we are slighted um, in less obvious ways that maybe are no less damaging? I mean, I think that the, um, the issue for me is, as a historian, how do you use these things to illuminate broader questions? Um, and that's what I think we tried to do with the news. I think the reality is that I look at every one of these moments as the opportunity for me to educate, for me to explore and try to sort of illuminate all the dark corners. That's the best I can do. Yeah, and I think the other thing that, that comes to mind for me is we often tend to focus on the individual events like the noose or the particular violent perpetrator and not ask about the patterns underneath that and really go below the surface and think about what are the structures in the system that are leading to these patterns that we can actually address and what are the mental models underneath that that we need to really change minds as a, as a, as a country and as a world. And so having those conversations and helping push people below the surface is really critical. All right, one more really quick question if somebody's got one. Uh, let's stay in the front in the orange dress. I think you, you deserve a question for wearing that uh, eye-catching dress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christine Andresen, Family Company Norway. I have a, maybe a provoking question, and that is concerning political correctness here in Davos. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had several complaints, and I had a discussion with Norwegian investors after a conference um, the other day, uh, where it was African leaders about the immigration to Europe and uh, European leaders. And no one were touching like the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. The reason why. Why are there no investments in Africa? And uh, I, it's, I discussed this with the Norwegians, and it's of course corruption, lack of legal system to protect it. But this, this team was not touched at all. And as another example, uh, we have a prime minister who's been, I've been here for 20 years, uh, who's been on stage for 20 years, 
and nothing is happening. The situation in Palestine is going the other way. And still, no one is kind of going in and saying, well, enough is enough, and why, why don't you do anything more? That is, uh, that is my question to you. What should we do in Davos to get back on track? Well, uh, I, I'm going to put this to Soyoung and Parv because you're the, uh, the, the newcomers who have, who, who, have been, who have been brought in to bring new perspectives to Davos, right, and to, to, and to diversify what has often not been a particularly diverse gathering. So yeah. what's your critique? Well, it's interesting because last year we had a situation um, within the young global leader community. Um, this is not like shared, right, recorded or whatever, right? Is this it recorded? Is. Oh, it's recorded? It is. Okay. All right. So uh, too late now. Yeah, too late now. No, uh, but there was a situation where actually um, there were a few very dissenting, strong dissenting voices, and the the community literally bashed and just totally, you know, bashed you know these few individuals for sharing um, opposing political views from the larger group. And it actually raised a really interesting question, because in a lot of the side dialogues, you know, people were kind of ranting and raving, and then I kind of was like, you know, like, well, isn't the purpose of this community that we should at least have enough safety and trust that we should be able to have these differing points of view? And so a code of conduct was actually created last year within our community to actually respectfully uh, to allow for these kind of different uh, points of view. So I think there is definitely hope. So I mean, to the credit of, um, of the, the WEF and the YGL community, they did act and then they put a community of conduct. So then the last annual meeting, we had to come, we all had to read the code of conduct and agree to disagree and to allow for constructive dialogue. So I do think that there is at least a model that the YGLs have started. And I think the broader WEF community could also adopt because um, I have also experienced that. You know, we tend to think alike, and if you have a different point of view, anything sensitive, you are not allowed, it's taboo to speak about in this, in this environment because of business reasons, for economic reasons, and for many other reasons. So, I mean, let's, let's, you know, it's business. It's not necessarily going to get you an investment if you disagree with, you know, their points of view. And so I think we need to almost move beyond that, because if this is meant to be an intellectual forum, um, it's hard, though, because you have individual people who may not be quite as enlightened and able to have those kind of conversations and may take it very emotionally, but if we can actually say it's okay. And that's kind of why I'm thinking, how do we create these codes or these words, these code words, it almost says that, that starts off with, I'm about to respectfully disagree with you, right? And, and so you almost create that space so the person is almost kind of stopped. Because sometimes we don't realize it. You know, we're not trying to be judgmental. We're not trying to, be, uh, to attack another point of view. And so even in this community, how do we actually create that? I think it's really critical, especially with everything that's happening globally. Um, I have hope because at least in our little community of, uh, you know, I don't know, a thousand people in the YGLs, we started to do that because of, but it happened because a few people were so attacked that they just literally stopped talking. And that is the worst thing that can happen in a community like this. You, you know, you need to kind of pull them out. Power of last word. From the Global Shapers community, really thinking about how we ask questions in these forums, and I think this may be the only exception of a of a workshop that I've seen where there wasn't a question from a shaper. Um, and so we we have really been pushing to ask questions wherever possible and be have a seat at the table and ask those questions. And the other thing I would um, point to is the we need to talk about session series that's happening at the loft. And those are really smaller discussion group forums where people are talking about issues that aren't as talked about in this forum. And so for WEF to continue to create that more in the mainstream and not just at the loft, right? And so going forward, how do we create that kind of environment in broader yeah. Davos and ensure that regardless of whether you're a political leader or a civic leader, that you are able to have your perspectives questioned by on the stage like this? Well, we could certainly go on for another hour on this topic, but uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks for a great discussion. Everybody.